So a few people have asked whether or not I could do an end-to-end -end workflow video. So we're going from soup to nuts. Let's do this. Hi, and welcome to episode 33 of Understanding Darktable. Before I dive into this, I do want to stress that workflow is very subjective. You know, what works for me may not work for you, Parts of what I do might work for you and other parts might not, you know, so don't feel like there's any hard and fast rules here. This is just one guy's approach. It, you know, you cherry pick from this what you will. Okay, having said all that, a couple of weeks ago on the Saturday, the 2nd of March, was the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras Parade. It was the culmination of a couple of weeks of festivities and it's this m massive parade that goes down Oxford Street and at that point I'd had my new A7 III for two months and I had barely touched it and I was feeling a bit guilty and I thought to myself you know what I'm going to jump on the motorbike I'm going to ride down to Sydney and take some runners so I don't have to walk around in motorbike boots all night and I'm just going to shoot the people in the crowd, not so much the parade, but just the people in the crowd, because it's just that kind of atmosphere that you can have fun with it. And Glyn, my photography podcast co-host, who is a brilliant shooter, if you haven't checked out his work, uh, I will put links to that down below in the description, uh, you should, he is a brilliant people photographer. And we were talking about it on the podcast before it happened, and he said, take your 15 mil wide angle he said and just get in close get in amongst it interact with the people you'll have a ball and i was a little bit skeptical of that because my 15 mil is a manual focus lens but i took his advice and i went with that and that's what i did now i've already imported and processed all of those images and so what i've done for this video is i have created a backup folder inside the folder where all the photos live and I've moved all my XMP files into that folder and then I've removed all of these images from Darktable and that's why Darktable thinks that uh, it has never seen these images before. So beginning of the process is obviously ingesting your photos from the memory card of your camera onto your hard drive. Now there's a multitude of different ways you could do that. You could do it manually with a file explorer. You could do it through Darktable. I personally, on Linux, use an app called Rapid Photo Downloader by Damon Lynch. It's a brilliant little app. Uh, I like it because it has just a, an easily workable UI. And I've spoken about this before. I'm not a huge fan of the way Darktable does it. You've got to go into preferences and change the text string in a field in order to change the directory that you copy the images to. So I generally don't use Darktable to get my images from the memory card onto the hard drive. I prefer to use this other app to do that. So I will assume that you've got your own way of working in terms of getting your images onto your hard drive. If we'll assume for now that your images are on your hard drive and are ready to be imported. Your first step is to go to the import module in the light table view and click on folder. And we can see here I'm on my photos drive, personal projects 2019. This is the folder that I want to import March the 2nd. And I'm just going to uncheck the import directories recursively checkbox. I know there are no images in the backup folder, but I don't want Darktable going and looking at those other XMP files and trying to interpret them or import them or do something with them. So I'm just going to uncheck that just to be safe. I am going to apply metadata on import because I've got creator and publisher as me and my website in the rights field. So that information will get written to every image that's in the folder that I'm about to import. Then it is simply a case of clicking open. Darktable will then read all of the images that are in that particular folder. And if we switch over to Nero again, we can see that it has now created new XMP sidecar files for every one of those images. Okay, so now it's a case of sorting. 
what do you want to do with the images? My first approach with this stuff is to go through and decide which images are rejects. And for that, I might control and mouse wheel just to make these thumbnails a little bit bigger. And I will click on the first image and I will then hit R for reject. And we can see it says rejecting one image. And if we now mouse over that, we can see we've got a little red X down here. And now I can just use my right arrow key to move through the images. Reject. Mm, I'll keep that, but I'm not going to, I probably won't use it, but I'm not going to reject it because it's not too bad because I did prefer the next image in that set. I'll keep that. I'm going to reject that. I will keep that, but not use it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, they're all okay. I'll keep that, keep those, keep that, keep that. I will probably reject that one because this one was lit better. And we're just moving through these pretty quickly. And, uh, okay, 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 okay. Hmm. I'm going to reject that one because of the guy with his back to us in the left hand side of the image. Don't know what that was, don't know what that was, don't know what that was. And I'll probably reject that. Okay, so we've now removed all of our rejects from Darktable. Whether or not you do that is up to you. Personally, I don't see the point of keeping stuff that I am absolutely never going to do anything with in Darktable. It's just clogging it up, and it means there's more stuff that I've got to pass my eyes over whenever I'm looking to process images. So I prefer to remove them from the database entirely. In fact, I will quite often actually hit send them to trash. If I know I'm never going to do anything with it, you know, if the camera missed focus, if somebody walked in front of the shot just as I took it, things like that, that you know are absolutely beyond hope. There is no way you're ever going to do anything with them. I'll quite often delete them. They're just not worth keeping on the hard drive. So the next thing I want to do is to tag all of my images that I've kept. Even if, the, even if they're not going to get used, I still want them tagged because... It means that if at any point in the future I need to come and search for images that relate to this event in one way, shape or another, I can find them because they're tagged. So first up, I'm going to select all of my images with Control A. I'm going to go to tagging and I'm going to type in Mardi Gras, which I've already done. And Darktable has brought back event, the pipe symbol, which appears above your backslash key and then Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras. Now, I don't put the year information into the tag because I might go and shoot the Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras again next year. And I can use the same event tag, but I can still search by that tag and the year separately if I need to. So if I need to find an image from the Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras from a particular year, I can do that without having to have the year information in the tag. So. I'm just going to double click that tag and that will apply that tag to all of the selected images. So double click and now that tag has been moved up to the top box in our tagging module. If I wanted to add a tag which didn't currently exist, like let's say I wanted to add Oxford Street. Oxford Street is quite well known in Sydney. It is sort of where the LGBTQI community hangs out if you like i don't want to nest oxford street under australia new south wales sydney simply because there might be other oxford streets that you know i might end up tagging at some point in the future so i want that as a standalone tag now as you can see dark table hasn't returned a result because i don't have a tag in the database yet so i click on new and that will add that tag to the database and it will add it to all of these images as well. I also want to add the tag Sydney. Now if I type Sydney like so, what comes back is all of the tags which actually begin with Sydney. But what Darktable hasn't presented me with is a tag Australia pipe New South Wales pipe Sydney. So what I would do is I'd put the pipe character at the beginning and that will then narrow that down. 
but I still haven't got just Sydney. Where is it? It's there. So I can click on that. And now Australia, New South Wales, Sydney has been added to all of these images. Now, people, I am probably the only guy who is as crazy anal as, <laughs> as anybody when it comes to adding people's names to a database. I'll tell you a little story. Back, sorry to just diverge a little bit, but this is relevant. In 2013, my wife's grandfather passed away. And we were driving home from the funeral and Kath said, you know, I'd really like to put together a little photo book of images of Jeff for my nana, who at that stage was still alive as well. And she said, would you be able to find any images that you took of Jeff while he was alive? And I went, yeah, sure. And because I am as manic as I am with tagging, I was able to come into here click on tag, type Jeff, and here he is, Jeff Leyland. Double clicked on that, and now I've got every image of Jeff that I ever took. And what was great about that was that this particular image here, which was quite a nice image of him, I didn't even remember having taken that photograph. And when I did the search and I saw that image, I was like, wow, I don't, I, I don't remember that, but that's a great image, you know? So that was one of the images that we put in the photo book. And if I hadn't have bothered to do that, then I probably never would have gone looking for that image. I probably never would have found that image because I just didn't even remember having taken it. Now, when you get family stuff like this, where you've got a whole bunch of people in the frame, that becomes quite a time-consuming process to go and add all of those tags but I do it and once you've added those tags into the database it's then quite quick to you know repeat that process to to add all of those tags to a whole bunch of images now if I've got a sequence of images of the family like this what I will generally do is pick one person at a time and add their name to all the images they appear in and I'll slowly work my way through all of the names of the people that I know until I've got all of them tagged in each image because some of the people who are, are in this image are not in that image so you know yes it's a little bit time consuming but I personally find it worth doing okay to go back to our Mardi Gras collection we've now got all of these images and we've got all of the tags in there that we want i don't know the names of any of these people so i don't have to worry about name tags so now i guess it's a case of working out which of these images do i really want to spend some time processing for that i'm going to zoom back in and i'm going to select the first image move my mouse off it and now I will simply use my right arrow key and my number one key to add one star ratings to all the images that I want to process. So I'm going to ignore that first image and I'm going to go one star here and here, here, here. Okay, so I sped that up because you didn't need to watch me go through and choose the images that I want to keep. But now I have got all of the images tagged with one star that I do want to work on. Now I can sort them by rating. And now all of my one star images are here at the top right down to there. So these are the images that I'm actually going to do something with. Now, that's pretty much it for the rating and sorting for me. Some people might say, well, when do you use star ratings and when do you use color flags? I don't think there's a hard and fast rule there. I think it's just whatever works for your brain. 
what I tend to do is I use star ratings to give me an indication of how likely I am to do something with an image. So I'll go through these images and I'll process them. And as I process them, some of them will show promise and some of them will, you know, show themselves to not be quite as good as I thought they were. The ones which do end up having more promise will get upgraded to a two star or maybe three star. And the ones that don't will get left as one star. Now, the way that I'll use color flags is, let's suppose there was a client involved. And the client comes back and says, oh, we love images X, Y, and Z, you know. What I will then do is flag those with a color to say to me, these are the ones that the client really likes. And if the client then says, hey, we need all of those images that we mentioned that we liked exported and you know delivered to our graphic designer i can then simply go and sort by the color flag versions and know that i'm just picking the photographs that the client has said that they want and i don't have to worry about all the stuff that i've star rated that i like that might be outside of what the client actually wants so that's just one interpretation like i said i don't think there's any hard and fast rule so in terms of processing, I will then click on my first image and I'll decide what am I going to do here? Well, for this, I'm certainly going to crop out the stuff that I don't need. I'll keep it in its original format and we'll cut this right down to probably about there. Try and get rid of as much of the stuff that we don't want in the image and then I'll move on. And I'll do a square crop with these guys. Okay, so I've now cropped all of those images into an aspect ratio that works for me. And so now it's a case of going back and actually deciding what kind of processing I want to do on these. I really don't feel like I need to do a whole lot with this image. I'm just going to use it as it came out of camera. This one, I might actually just try and lighten up this guy's face a little bit because I feel like he's just a little bit dark there. So I'm just going to apply a little bit of a tone curve. I am just going to hide my film strip for a sec. Just going to do a drawn mask, do an oval shape, which needs to be smaller, obviously. And that will pretty much do it. Just before and after. That's before, that's after. That's just lightened him up a little bit. And again, I don't think I'm going to do anything more to it than that. Moving on, pretty much use that as it is. Keep that as it is. Keep that as it is. Okay, this one, I know I've got an issue. I completely missed the focus on this image and I didn't realize it at the time. Everything is soft, but at least these guys are a little bit more in focus than what's in the background. So. Probably by applying some heavy sharpening, I might get away with it. So we'll have a look. We're going to dial this right up. If I bring that radius right up, because they were so out of focus, I've got to use a fairly large radius to give Darktable something to work on. That's actually done a decent job if we compare before and after. It's still soft. It's always going to be a little bit soft, but I'm actually happy with what that's done. It's salvaged what should have been a throwaway. Yeah, it, I don't know. Comes down to personal preference, I guess. Moving on. This needs to be a little bit lighter. I'm just going to go with a simple tone curve. Happy with that. Moving on. This guy, don't need to worry about. That's all good. Again, a little bit soft on the focus here, so I'll probably go into sharpen and crank that up. And again, that sort of salvages a, you know, 
what was pretty soft to begin with. It makes it livable. It's not awesome. I mean, you got to remember, I was shooting a manual focus lens in pretty low light. So, uh, uh, again, probably just want to lift this out with a little bit of a tone curve, bring the mid-tones out a bit. Uh, that's pretty much all I'm going to do with that image. Same again. Might just lighten this up. I might just go for a little bit of a white balance tweak here because they do feel that like skin tones are maybe just a little bit warmer than they should be. Just drop that down just a touch. Yeah. Split the difference. Yep, I'll live with that. Moving on. I'm actually thinking I don't like that image now, so I'm just going to hit the one key and that will remove the one star rating on that. Where did I get to? I got to there. Next. These guys. Okay, again, going to just bring this out with the tone curve, just bring a bit more light into this. Actually, now that I look at that, let's try some sharpening, see if we can salvage it. Oh yeah. That makes it workable. I might actually change the crop on that though to a square crop. So let's go square. Yeah, I think that actually, yeah, that helps that. Good. Uh, same again, just want to bring her out a little bit. That's nice. Okay. What I really want here is to just lighten up her face the and these three faces here because these guys are all in a little bit of shadow so what I will do is just lighten the whole thing up and then go for a drawn mask I'll go with a path just gonna go across here across here down to here over to here down to here up over here down to there and then close that off and that's done a reasonable job of just lightening them up a little bit. Actually, I just need to tweak that path. I just want to bring that feather in because it was just hitting that background a little bit too much. That's better. So before, yep. And after, love it. Hang on. Let me have a look. Yep, yep, yep. All good. It's, I mean, it's not great. You know, none of this stuff is award-winning photography. It's uh, really just photojournalism, if you like. But um, I love these balloons. They actually had lights inside the balloons. Uh, I'm not actually going to do anything with that. Pretty happy with that. <laughs> okay, I might just lighten up the face on this guy. I can. Oh, he's right. Oh, he. Yep, okay. And we'll go drawn mask and might actually shrink that right down. Now, before, after. Yep, nice. Nice. Okay. Next, these guys, I'm not even going to touch that. That's fine. Okay, so I wish I could have waited a little bit more before I took this image and the, let these three people disappear behind him. Um, I think, as I said to Glenn on the podcast, I was conscious of the fact that there were more people walking towards us behind this guy, and I was afraid that they were going to end up in the shot, and so I kind of rushed it and... You know, you probably saw when I was cropping that over here on the right, there's a guy leaning over with his butt facing the camera. So I had to be very uh, judicious with the crop on the right hand side. Clearly, I would have preferred a little bit more exposure here as well. Although simple tone curve kind of helps to bring a lot of that out. That's actually not too bad. What I might do here, though, is a drawn mask just so that I can maybe let what's over there on the right-hand side, or in, in fact, all around him, basically, just let that 
drop off a little bit. Well, it certainly lifted him out, even though it hasn't really pushed that stuff down. Oh, no, it was never going to push that stuff down. It was all about lifting him out, wasn't it? Now, what I might do is try a bit of exposure adjustment just to try and push that background stuff down. And what I will do then is use the same mask that I used on the tone curve and then invert that because I want to swap it around. There we go. Now on a tone that's going to look a bit nasty. That is very much a giveaway that I've done something there. I guess I might just have to settle for not quite as much of an exposure adjustment. I could spend a lot more time trying to do something with that, but I just don't know that it's worth the effort, to be honest. It's better than it was, uh, and it's not an ideal image to begin with, but, I, but he was a great character, and I sort of felt like it warranted a shot. Moving on. Actually, I'm not so enamored with this image either now. Let's see if we can just sharpen this up a little bit. Yeah, I was maybe too close to them. We've got quite a lot of distortion to the faces on the extremities here. I could potentially try to look for a lens profile which might correct for that, but I'm not sure that that's really going to be possible. Okay, I've been through all of this looking for a lens profile that might help the distortion here, and I haven't found one, so I'm just going to move on uh, to the next image. Now, here we've got quite a bright highlight at the bottom, and I may be a little bit overexposed at the top, so I will go to my exposure module. Dial in a little bit of negative exposure, bring those highlights right down. That actually has got those guys in not a bad place in terms of exposure. I'm just going to use a graduated density down here to darken this pedestal that they're standing on. I want it to go the other way. That's better. So now there's a little bit of fall off to the light on the bottom there because of the graduated density. I've added three stops of graduated density just to the bottom. Uh, I have covered this in a previous video. The direction in which you right click and drag will determine whether the little triangles are facing down or facing up. So I want to go that way so that they're facing up so that the negative exposure is on the bottom. And that's just balanced that a little better. Moving on. Oh, we're done. Okay, so now we've processed all of our images. We have to ask ourselves, what do we want to do with these images? Now, for me, it would be a case of posting them to my photography website. So I would select all of the images that I want to export. And then I would go to my export selected module. Now, I'm a big fan of saving presets that I use on a regular basis. So if I wanted to send these to my website, that would be Bruce Williams Photography Upload, I simply click on that preset and that determines which folder the exported images will go to. So Bruce Pictures BWP Upload and then use the original file name. I want them as JPEGs, 70% compression, maximum size 2400 wide by 1000 high and then click export and now Darktable will crank away on exporting all of these images to disk at those resolutions that I have specified in the preset. Now if I decided I also wanted to export these to say Instagram I could go to my Instagram preset and that will send them to this pictures slash Instagram folder, again using the file name as the exported name, 80% compression, maximum size 2000 by 2000. So what that means is that the long edge, regardless of orientation, will be 2000 pixels. And I could again export those and they will all get exported to that folder. That's a bit of a long-winded explanation of my workflow, and it's really only one style of photography. I will grant you that. 
as I said in this video, this is sort of photojournalism. I was simply documenting an event. It's a very different style of photography and a very different workflow in Darktable to my holiday photos. It's a very different workflow to processing a photo shoot with a model in a studio under controlled lighting. You know, you could do a whole series of videos on workflow just on the different types of photography. I personally think that would be a little bit boring, but maybe some people would appreciate it. I don't know. I hope all of this has been of some value to somebody, and my apologies if it has not. I think what I covered at the beginning, in terms of ingest, rejecting, tagging, star rating, all of that sort of stuff, I think that's fairly universal, regardless of the type of shoot that you do. So hopefully that at least has been helpful. Okay, that is going to have to do it. Please sing out in the comments as to what you liked and didn't like, and uh, yeah, we can continue the discussion. All right, catch you in the next one.